the Shosha, France, World War I. Let's kick things off with a weapon so notoriously terrible that it became the punchline of military history, the French Shosha. Picture this, it's 1915 and France needs a light machine gun. They need it cheap, they need it fast, and boy oh boy did they deliver on the cheap part. The Shosha was manufactured with the quality control of a lemonade stand, featuring parts that were barely held together by hopes and dreams. This beauty had a semicircular magazine with open sides. That's right, they looked at trench warfare, you know, the conflict famous for mud, dirt, and debris, and thought, let's make a magazine that welcomes all of that garbage directly into the feeding mechanism. The result? Jams. So many jams, you could open a breakfast cafe. Soldiers reported that the gun would malfunction after firing just a few rounds. One American soldier famously said he'd rather throw the shosha at the enemy than actually try to shoot it. The recoil was so violent that it felt like getting punched by an angry baguette repeatedly. The barrel would overheat faster than a microwave burrito, and the sights were about as accurate as a fortune cookie prediction. But here's the kicker. They made over 262,000 hours of these things. That's a quarter million soldiers thinking, are you kidding me right now? Every time they had to use one. The Type 94 Nambu Pistol, Japan, World War II. All right, let's hop over to Japan and talk about a pistol that was essentially a lawsuit waiting to happen. The Type 94 Nambu. Now, the Type 94 had one special feature that really set it apart from other sidearms. It could fire without pulling the trigger. I'm not joking. There was an exposed sear bar on the side of the weapon that, if pressed, would discharge the pistol. Imagine holstering your sidearm and accidentally shooting yourself in the leg because your holster touched the wrong part of the gun, or leaning against a wall, or literally anything touching this death trap incorrectly. The magazine would fall out if you looked at it wrong, the safety was practically decorative, and the trigger pull was so heavy you needed the grip strength of a rock climber just to fire intentionally. But don't worry, because remember, you didn't always need the trigger. Japanese officers were issued these as sidearms, which means they were walking around with loaded pistols that had a shoot-randomly button just chilling on the side. This wasn't a weapon. It was a portable anxiety attack. The Ross Rifle, Canada, World War I. Oh, Canada, our home and native land of really questionable rifle decisions. Let me introduce you to the Ross Rifle, a weapon that perfectly embodied looks good on paper, terrible in practice. Sir Charles Ross had designed this rifle to be incredibly accurate, and to his credit, it was accurate. On a clean, well-maintained shooting range, this thing could hit targets all day long. Unfortunately, World War I wasn't fought on clean, well-maintained shooting ranges. The Ross rifle had such tight tolerances that the smallest amount of mud, dirt, or trench gunk would cause it to jam completely. And since WWI was basically fought in giant mud pits, this was a bit of a problem. But wait, it gets better. The bolt could be reassembled incorrectly, and when fired in this configuration, the bolt would fly backward directly into the shooter's face. Yes, you read that correctly. Soldiers could accidentally turn their rifle into a face-seeking missile launcher. Canadian soldiers were so frustrated with the Ross that they would literally scavenge British Lee Enfield rifles from fallen soldiers rather than use their issued weapons. When your troops are willing to loot corpses for a better gun, you know you've messed up. The Canadian military eventually withdrew the Ross from frontline service in 1916, but not before countless soldiers had to deal with this mechanical nightmare. The Liberator Pistol, USA World War II, the United States once had a brilliant idea. What if we made the cheapest, simplest pistol possible and airdropped millions of them into occupied Europe for resistance fighters? Enter the FP-45 Liberator, a single-shot pistol that cost $2.10 to manufacture in 1942, about $40 today. This wasn't meant to be a primary weapon. It was supposed to be used to shoot an enemy soldier once, take their better weapon, and then maybe use the Liberator as a paperweight. The Liberator was a smoothbore pistol, which means it had the accuracy of throwing a rock, except the rock would probably be more reliable. It had no sights, no rifling, and an effective range of about close enough to smell what they had for breakfast. To reload it, you had to manually eject the spent casing with a stick. A stick. They included a little wooden dowel for this purpose. Nothing says advanced military technology like needing a tiny stick to operate your firearm. The trigger pull was approximately 900 pounds. 
Okay, not really, but it felt like it. You needed to really commit to pulling that trigger, which gave you plenty of time to reconsider your life choices. The truly wild part, the U.S. manufactured one million of these things, but most were never distributed. They just sat in warehouses because even resistance fighters looked at them and said, yeah, we'll take our chances. The Krumlauf, Germany, World War II. Sometimes military innovation goes too far, way, way too far. And that brings us to Nazi Germany's Krumlauf, which translates to curved barrel. Yes, they made a barrel that curved. Picture a STG-44 assault rifle, a perfectly serviceable weapon. And then someone says, what if we bent the barrel at a 30-degree angle so soldiers could shoot around corners without exposing themselves? On paper, it's kind of genius. In reality, it was an absolute disaster. The curved barrel would wear out after firing about 300 rounds because, shockingly, bullets don't enjoy being forced to make sharp turns at high velocity. The barrel would crack, bullets would fragment, and the accuracy was essentially somewhere in that general direction, maybe. They even developed a 90-degree version for use in tanks. 90 degrees, that's literally shooting sideways. The bullets would shatter almost immediately, and the barrel life was measured in dozens of rounds instead of thousands. The periscope attachment that allowed soldiers to aim around corners would get destroyed by the bullet fragments and gases escaping from the disintegrating barrel. This weapon perfectly represents the just-because-you-can doesn't mean you should principle. They were so preoccupied with whether they could curve a barrel, they didn't stop to think whether they should. The Girajet rocket pistol, USA, 1960s. Let's fast forward to the 1960s when someone looked at conventional firearms and thought, what if we made a gun that shoots tiny rockets instead of bullets? That person had clearly been watching too much science fiction. The Gyrojet was a rocket pistol that fired 13 mm miniature rockets instead of traditional ammunition. Sounds cool, right? Wrong. Here's the problem. Rockets need time to accelerate. So at close range, where you'd actually want a pistol to work, the Gyrojet rockets were moving so slowly they could barely penetrate a phone book. Yes, someone tested this, and yes, a phone book stopped it. By the time the rockets reached effective velocity, they'd traveled 60 feet. If your attacker is 60 feet away, you don't need a pistol, you need a restraining order. The accuracy was terrible because rocket propulsion is inherently less stable than a spinning bullet. The ammunition was expensive, finicky, and would occasionally just not fire. You'd pull the trigger and get a disappointing click instead of a space-age rocket launch. The military tested them and politely said, thanks, but no thanks. The Girajet became a curiosity for collectors rather than a practical weapon, proving that not every problem needs a rocket-powered solution. The M16A1, early Vietnam War version. Now, I know what you're thinking. The M16 is iconic. It's been used for decades. And you're right, but the early Vietnam War version was a catastrophic mess. The M16 was designed by Eugene Stoner to be a lightweight, accurate rifle firing a smaller caliber round. In testing, it was fantastic. Then the military made some improvements. First, they changed the gunpowder type without proper testing, which increased fouling and residue. Then they told soldiers the rifle was self-cleaning and didn't need maintenance, which was a lie of legendary proportions. The result? Soldiers in Vietnam found their rifles jamming constantly in combat situations. There are heartbreaking accounts of soldiers found dead next to disassembled M16s having died while trying to clear jams during firefights. The rifle was also issued without cleaning kits initially because of that whole self-cleaning nonsense. chrome line chambers weren't standard yet, which meant the rifles would corrode in the humid Vietnamese jungle. The magazines were also problematic. The 20-round magazines would cause jams if loaded to full capacity, so soldiers learned to only load 18 rounds. Imagine being told your 20-round magazine works best with 18 rounds. That's like buying a dozen donuts and being told to throw two away for best results. Congressional investigations were launched, cleaning kits were rushed to Vietnam, the rifle was eventually improved with chrome-lined chambers, better magazines, and proper cleaning supplies. The modern M16 and M4 are reliable weapons, but that early version, it nearly destroyed soldiers' faith in their equipment. So there you have it a collection of firearms that made soldiers reconsider their career choices. From face-punching bolts to self-firing pistols, these weapons prove that not every innovation is an improvement.
These stories remind us why military equipment testing and quality control are so crucial. Every malfunction in combat could mean the difference between life and death for soldiers who have no choice but to use what they're given. Modern soldiers deserve reliable equipment, and thankfully, most of today's military firearms are far more dependable than these historical disasters. But let's never forget the lessons learned from these mechanical nightmares. What other military equipment disasters should we cover? Let me know in the comments below. And remember, if your gun needs a stick to reload, maybe it's time for an upgrade.